Now, I heard something else that I think we, we need to at least mention, which is, I think it was you that said that we have pseudomonas colonization, and then we have pseudomonas infection, an invasive pseudomonas disease. Um, what's the difference? I mean, I guess the, the, the clear thing is that a lot of patients are colonized with all kind of microbiology, um, but we're only concerned with patients who actually develop clinical infections from the standpoint. So colonization will often precede infection occurring, but certainly we're concerned about the patients once they develop the pneumonia from that having that long-standing colonization of the organism. So I want to bring it back full circle, then, okay. which goes to what I was saying, I think. You can be colonized with pseudomonas, but in order to get an, uh, an invasive infection with pseudomonas, don't you need to be sicker? Don't you need to be one of those patients that's already in some way really ill? Or can you just get pseudomonas out of the blue? Well, generally healthy patients in the community don't develop pseudomonal infection for right. the most part. I mean, there may be a few exceptions to that rule. But, uh, you know, to develop a true pseudomonal infection, I mean, it really requires certain host factors. And I think right. that's what we've been commenting on. Uh, but in addition to the host factors, I think it is important to recognize that it's a very virulent organism. And I think, you know, the audience really needs to be clear on that particular point. And because it's a virulent organism and it has certain virulence mechanisms in place, antibiotic therapy does become important because we don't have mechanisms for treating the virulence of the pathogen. So we have to really err on the side of treating it with an appropriate antibiotic so regimen. death to bugs. Death to pseudomonas. Death to pseudomonas, but again, focusing on the antimicrobial aspect of it since we have limited options for tackling the virulence factors. Right. Well, and, and more importantly, focusing on prevention. Yeah. There are a raft of things that we can do to prevent severe infection in our critically ill patients, whether it's early ambulation, early liberation from the ventilator, less sedation, chlorhexidine bathing. I mean, there, you know, one place where we take infection prevention very seriously in the hospital actually is the ICU, where we have bundles of, of protocols that actually have been evidence-based and shown in randomized trials to effectively prevent some severe infections. And so if you're going to work in an environment where you know it's enriched for the risk and bad outcome associated with the, the bug you're describing, then it's incumbent upon all of us to actually start this conversation at what are we doing for prevention. So you want to back off. I mean, let's, before we even talk about antibiotics, if we can prevent people from becoming infected, or if they're colonized, we, for, we prevent them from becoming invasively infected, that's the ideal. Correct. Right? And we have techniques for that. So whether it's a VAP bundle, right. or it, it's something else, I mean, the, as you said, chlorhexidine, that would be ideal, right? Uh, the data for chlorhexidine, I think, is more controversial than it used to be. <laughs> we've got a positive trial. We've got some follow-on negative trials. I heard a chuckle on the right side. Uh, I mean, again, your, your patient smells better if they're bathed in chlorhexidine every day. But uh, I think I think people are. I think it speaks to the fact that people are striving to find good, effective, inexpensive strategies. Uh, some of which there's a lot of abundant evidence to support, some of which is controversial, and you make a decision about the risk-benefit trade-off. And I think some of our most invasive things that we do, I think there's a conscious effort in the ICU to shorten the duration of those, right? So ventilation might be an option Absolutely. of that. Pulling central lines sooner in these patients, so those are known risk factors for hospital-acquired infections and pseudomonas in particular. And so I think a lot of efforts in prevention come along those lines. By the way, I think the PC phrase now is healthcare facility-associated infections. Of course, yes. You know, it's gone. It, it's 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 morphed again. And and obviously another component which is very important in our efforts to uh, prevent infections is our use of antibiotics and what antibiotics are we choosing as okay. a matter of uh, protocol. And we are going to discuss that later. But uh, just to uh, mention that uh, a lot of that is actually in our hands. Well, I mean, we talk about pseudomonas as if it affects one organ system. Like people always think about pseudomonas pneumonia, which is common. But there are lots of other pseudomonas infections too, right? I mean, pseudomonas is a pathogen that once it sets up shop in your hospital can cause any kind of infection because it's a, a, a bug host um, interaction. And so it can certainly be a leading pathogen in ventilator associated or hospital acquired pneumonia, but it can still be a leading pathogen in bloodstream infection. In my uh, colleagues in the surgical ICU, they see surgical site infections and post-op mediastinitis after cabbage. So I mean, if pseudomonas is around, pseudomonas will find a place to get in and you know, very much the same way with Acinetobacter. If it's set up shop, it's not, it's not specific for one infection or one organ infection. It causes infections. And in any of those syndromes, including even urinary tract infection, you need to be vigilant. Is there one infection that's worse than others? I mean well, but, but, but before that, just, just to add to, um, 
to what Andy says, um, I think it's important to understand the biology of Pseudomonas as well um, when you try to predict what kind of infections. It's important to remember that Pseudomonas is ubiquitous. It's kind of a moisture type of bacteria. It exists in the environment. It tends to colonize people, particularly people who get antibiotics and are in healthcare institutions, particularly on mucosal surfaces. And then anything you do to violate the integrity of the mucosa, by putting a line that breaks the mucosa going into the vein, by putting a urinary catheter that, that violates the mucosa of the urinary tract, by putting endotracheal tubes and so forth, will provide pseudomonas with an opportunity. So you tell me what kind of violation of mucosa you did with your patient, and I'll tell you what the patient is going to be vulnerable <clears throat> to develop. But that's just, that's not unique to pseudomonas. You can say that that's staph. Absolutely. You could say it's anybody. Absolutely. Right? This is not unique to Pseudomonas. What is unique to Pseudomonas are a few factors. One is, as Andy said, once you get once you get colonized with it, it's really hard to get rid of it. So and long-term colonization, you know, if you look at the risk of infection, it's related to colonization and how long you're going to be colonized with the bacteria. And what is the ability of this bacteria to survive the antibiotics in the environment? And Pseudomonas, as you know, has a great ability. So Pseudomonas is not unique in principle, but it's more quantitatively that makes it more likely to infect those patients. What scares you guys more? Is it Pseudomonas pneumonitis, Pseudomonas uh, cystitis, Pseudomonas something else? I mean, is there one organ system which, when infected with Pseudomonas, is worse than all the others? What scares me most is when Pseudomonas infects my sickest patients, because they're the least uh, able to tolerate infection, and they're the ones who require the most aggressive approach. But aren't those the ones that are the most likely to get it? That's, That's what makes this bug so nasty. Right, but, but it, I mean, it is in some way a tautology, right? Right. But I think Yoav's point about it's a function of the patient, not a function of the bug. Right. Okay. And so if you've had a kidney transplant, I'm worried about an ascending tract infection from Pseudomonas. Sure. If you've been on a ventilator with acute lung injury from flu or on ECMO for two weeks, I'm worried about pneumonia. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it, it is a pathogen that goes where the host defense is weakest. And so that, that I can't say that, can I say that pneumonia is associated with the highest crude mortality rate of Pseudomonas versus urinary tract infections? Yeah, sure, but that's because it's easy to eradicate pus in the bladder and it's hard to eradicate pus in the lung. So that, that, then that's true also for every other pathogen. 